You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers. Today, I'm chatting with Tanya Grantham. She was one of the IAVRPT Vet Rehab of the Year finalists in 2020. She's based here in South Africa in a place called Benoni and has a practice called Animal Health and Hydro. Now, she chats to me about opening up multiple branches, the pros and the cons, and all the lessons that she's learned, and how her next steps are going to be now to be franchising her practice. Now, if you have a practice and you're looking for any business resources, did you know that on the Online Pet Health Members platform, we have an area called the Business Basics. We have loads of webinars, um, downloadable PDFs, there's training. So if you're a member, head over to the Business Basics area. If you're not a member, we also have a free area for Online Pet Health. And in here, we have webinars um, in hydrotherapy, small animal, equine, but we also have another business area here in the free area. So you can go and check it out. We've got some training, some downloadable PDFs. If you go to www.onlinepetshealth.com forward slash free and sign up, you can go and check out all the resources that we have for business owners. So if you're thinking about expanding your practice, you don't want to miss this chat with Tanya. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Megan. It's really always wonderful to be a guest on one of your shows. Thank you. Tanya, I know the listeners um, have heard loads and loads about you because you've been on the podcast so many times. But for those of the new listeners, won't you tell them a little bit about yourself? You're a little bit about me. I am a qualified vet. I qualified a long time ago. I ran small animal practice for almost 14 years. And then I moved into physical rehabilitation and pain management. So I'm a qualified veterinary acupuncturist, I've done the CCRP, I've done the canine body workers course, and a whole lot of other things on top of all of that. And now I work in South Africa, um, in Gauteng, and I have currently two practices that I run. It was three, but um, we've moved away from the third one. And yeah, we just try and make a, um, our services available to as many patients as possible. And you also were the IAVRPT, one of the finalists um, for last year's um, awards, which was absolutely amazing. I was so proud of you, um, being you. a fellow South African, um, for you to be nominated um, as one of the finalists. So yeah, congratulations on that. Thank you. I, I think it was really nice at the end of 2020, which was a tough year for everyone. Um, but because as, a, as fellow South Africans, I think it was a really positive thing. It was, it was amazing. I agree. It was fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. And we're looking forward to, to this year again. Yeah. So it's going to be a yearly thing that the IAVRPT has started, which I think is really great. I think it's mm -hmm. amazing to recognize the vet we have as in our field. We've got people all over the world um, doing amazing things. Yeah. So it's yeah, very, very exciting. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. It's nice to read everyone's stories. Yeah. And you, and and you, you do a great job also introducing us to all of those, you know, all of those fantastic people. <laughs> around the world it's, it's really cool yeah I, I must say it for me it was so amazing because there were finalists from so many different countries um and you know it was obviously voted for by the community so like it just shows how international our vet mm. rehab community is and you yeah, know learning about everyone all over the world yeah it was really it was an incredible award and i'm i'm so so glad that we're carrying on with it so every single year unfortunately this year, the award will not be given at Cambridge, which we were hoping at the IAVRPT conference, but it's confirmed for next year. I think we are going to have the IAVRPT conference in Cambridge. Um, and so all the awards will be given out. Um, so there'll be three awards next year. So it'll be the yeah. 2020, 2021 and the 2022 <laughs> award. So um, yeah, it's going to be one you guys don't want to miss. Um, so for those of you that are interested in the IAVRPT conference next year in Cambridge, um, we'll put a link um, in, the, in the description for you guys to go and check it out. Today, um, Tanya, we're going to be chatting about running multiple branches. Um, so won't you tell us, you know, how you started your practice? Um, so all of us um, start in different ways. I know for me, I started um, sort of as a mobile clinic and then I sort of rented space from a few vets. 
Um, then eventually moved into my home and um, was still doing it vets. And then eventually I decided I need to be in one place and then opened up my practice. Um, so tell us your journey. How, how did it all start? Well, my journey in rehab started with my own um, health uh, crisis. I think that's true for many people. Um, and uh, I ended up selling my small animal standard veterinary practice and spent time getting better. And in that period, it was about a, a two and a half to three year period, I needed to earn some income. And I started locuming as a vet because nobody really wanted to employ me part time, didn't know whether I was coming or not. And so I started because of my own crisis, I started investigating holistic approaches, natural medicine. I'd done lots of surgeries. Um, on dogs and cats and wondered why some responded really well and others didn't. And so there was already an interest actually in hydrotherapy. Um, and so it seemed a natural progression, not being able to work in the normal veterinary practice anymore in the hours that I wanted. I started looking at rehab and acupuncture and those modalities. And then um, I live on a small holding. And there was a gentleman here who retired and he was running a um, almost a small design factory, but metal works on our property. And there was a building that became available. And my husband thought that he was going to get a new workshop and I had other ideas. And so I basically said, well, I can't get what I want in the veterinary field. I'm gonna go into rehab. And so I did, we built, we built the pool. So we didn't put in um, a standard pool. We built the pool um, and that's how my journey began. I thought, well, I either make it or I don't. And then I have to go back to vet practice. And here I am, you know, 13 years or 14 years later, um, very much still hugely involved in physical rehab or physiotherapy. And I've extended that building by, by twice as much. So it's, it's double the size it was originally. And, and we've investigated other branches and practices and yeah. So I never went back to standard vet work. Yeah. I think once you make that move and that mm. change, um, yeah, you just fall in love with veterinary rehabilitation and you just, yeah. I mean, I must say for me, when I look back at private practice as a vet, um, there are things that I do miss, but there are loads of things that I don't miss. And obviously right now I don't practice vet rehab anymore. So I haven't practiced for a few years. I took a sabbatical um, when I had my second child and um, I definitely will be going back. Just not sure when, but I miss vet rehab so much. Mm. Um, but yeah, I don't miss anal glands. Well, from vet rehab. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's anal glands. Not. Yeah. There are lots of things I don't miss. Um, so, so you obviously then you went straight into opening up your clinic. How many years um, did it take for you to, to settle that clinic? Um, because obviously like everyone goes through this journey. So sometimes people like stay mobile. Other times they have a clinic like you and then they get to a point where they decide, oh, I need to open up another branch, you know? So like how many years did it take you to get to that point? Okay, so I... I did everything on my own for the first two years, everything, cleaned, opened the gate, did the invoicing, wrote the patient notes, treated the patients, did the ordering, paid the bills, I did everything on my own for two years. And then because of the way that things do grow, and they do, everybody will have noticed that by now, um, I needed an assistant. So it took me two years to get my first assistant. And she had completed the canine body works course. So I didn't get an administrative assistant. I got someone who could assist me with the patients and, and everything else. Um, so um, I then eventually, so that was a, probably another, let me just think another two years um, with lots happening in between. And basically, so in four years, I ended up with a therapist and a full-time administrative receptionist person and we've we've gone from there because we ended up um seeing so many patients and word of mouth was amazing i needed another therapist and once you got another therapist you know where do you stop you and and so she lives um literally about 40 kilometers from this practice in pretoria east and it seemed a natural progression to start talking about well 
how can we help the people or the patients in Pretoria East? Because she had a property and, you know, it lent itself to, um, there were some uh, outbuildings that we could use as a rehab facility. So that was three years ago. So that progression from a therapist and a uh, admin person and me probably took another three years before we had another therapist and the thoughts of um, opening another branch. That branch has been in existence with lots of stops and starts for about three years. And then there've been others that have come and gone, other ventures that have come and gone. Um, so, so in total, I mean, I've been here now for, for 14 years. Yeah, so you've got your so, one main branch or your main clinic, and then you've mm. had the branches. So let's chat about the stops and the starts and the, the ventures that you started, because this is the thing, it's like it's such a big decision to open up mm. another branch. And you always think like, is this the right thing? Um, it obviously pulls you in two different places or three different places. Um, so I think, you know, we're going to go through like all the pros and the cons of having mm. lots of branches, because they are pros but then there are cons. Um, and I think with our work, where we're spending so much time with our patients, you know, especially if you don't have that administrative help, um, it's a really big step. And you mm. could get yourself into a situation where you're completely just overwhelmed with admin. And then you, you're so busy with your clients and your patients that you don't have the time to be able to, to, to juggle everything and you can get yourself into trouble. So let's backtrack to um, that first one that you opened. Why, why the stops and starts? What are the, the handbags? What are the things that um, cause issues for you there? No, I think the biggest thing that caused an issue was um, finance for equipment. So particularly an underwater treadmill. I mean, we've spoken before about uh, I want to design my own and manufacture my own and I've had three attempts at that. It's cost me a lot of money and I still don't have a machine. Um, I'm currently working on my fourth attempt. But in the meantime, I, um, so I hold on to that vision. But in the meantime, I managed to secure a, a loan for the equipment. So I think if you are investing in, um, if your financial investment is big or you need a piece of equipment where your financial investment is big, you really need to, um, be able to support that from your original practice. Um, that's really, really, really important. Um, I think this, so that's, that's been a, probably my biggest stumbling block. I have really good people on my team. They've been with me for a very long time. So we have developed systems. Um, we know each other well. We know what our appointment system is. We know how to book. Um, we know how to answer the phone. We know how to deal with a client. So the other the really important thing that I think you need is you need, a, you need a set of systems because if you want to replicate something, you can't do it if you don't have a means of replicating because you can't do it all on your own. So you can't be the, the uh, limiting factor in your progression or your expansion. And I think for a lot of people, we're so excited and we're so enthusiastic and we so much want to make a difference and we think we can. But if we don't have that support in, in all those other areas, we're setting ourselves up for burnout and compassion fatigue and all those things that we know happen in our profession. And so that just very briefly, I mean, there's obviously loads of other things we can explore, but I think those are the most important things. Yeah, I think we're busy with some training on our pet health now in our business area um, on creating a standard operating procedures manual. And um, that's so important, you know. And if I think about back to my practice, you know what happens is when it's just you, you know exactly what's going on in your practice. You've got all these things in your mind, you write to the list, you do things, then you get one person who joins you. And then it's a sort of a solo K okay because you can just, the two of you just talking, right? And you're saying, you need to do this, you need to, and then you have this conversation. Then another other person joins and then the little miscommunication start because you think that that other person told the the newer person what to do and the more people you get the more complicated yeah. things get and that's really when those standard op operating procedures systems are so important because you cannot be everywhere and yeah. what happens is if you're that controlling type like that a type personality which is which i am you know i want everything to be exactly right 
if you have that system, then the system is there and they can, people can just follow it, you know, but you can't be in all the rooms. So you can't be telling people all the time. Um, yeah, especially for branches. It's so, mm. so important. And most of the time, those systems work for one branch and work for the other. You might have to tweak them because there might be something that's um, slightly different. Um, but yeah, getting all your systems into play and everyone knowing where to find those systems um, yep. you know so like if for example like one of the things that i remember used to happen like if the electricity goes out or the treadmill goes down let's say the pump something goes on the pump what happens right what is the procedure because there are clients that are on their way that are coming there now and mm. um, obviously there are clients that are coming later and um, they are people that need to be phoned to get the underwater treadmill working again. There's all these little systems that have to, all these things that have to happen and have to happen quickly. And they can't happen one hour later when you're in a consult and you've just gone in with your first time seeing somebody. They can't yes. wait for you. Um, you don't really want them. They don't know whether, should we actually go in and interrupt and ask what to do? But if it's all there, everything just happens. You come out, they say, treadmill's down. These people have been phoned. We're waiting and everything is is all sorted. So yeah, that's something that's so important. I think just generally in practices, whether you've got mm. multiple branches or even one. And what I would suggest to the listeners, if you guys are like Tanya was in the beginning and I was the same, just you on your own, now's the time to write the system. Yeah, write it down. Absolutely. What happens is you only get to the point where you think, oh my gosh, we need systems and we need this standard operating procedures manual. But then you're so busy because you've got all the people and now your practice is so busy. You don't have the time to sit down and actually do the, to write mm. all these things. And so you just never get it done. Um, so it's when you're quiet and you just start, it's a really good thing to do um, from the beginning. The thing is that we don't always anticipate that we're going to grow to the extent that we do. And yeah. so we don't think about it. But that advice is very sound and it's also part of, um, you know, that whole working in your, in your business versus working on your business. You know, in order to, to create a model that is going to sustain you and enable you to move forward and expand, if that's what you choose, then you actually have to spend time working on your business, which is what all these systems and procedures are all, all about, which most of us find boring most of the time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We just want to treat our patients, right? That's, yep. what, that's what we're trained to do. So all these kind of things are like, oh, I mean, they go, they get on a list, so they just get pushed down. And then we cross yep. some things out and then we write them again on the list again, right? They just stay on that list, never get done. Indeed. So it's so, okay. So then you had the two practices. So do you still have that branch? Um, yes. Yes. Now, okay. So are those yes, the two practices that you currently have now? So the two that I currently have, um, I... I'm bought in partnership with another vet. I bought a, a rehab practice the month before lockdown. Um, and due to all of the lockdown and our geographical positioning, so it was about 55 kilometers from the Benoni branch, but the vets with whom I went into partnership lived close to that branch. So out of necessity, when with all the changes in lockdown and so on, I said, well, you're going to have to run that one. Yeah. Um, and to her credit, she ran it exceptionally well. And in December, she made me an offer to buy my shares. Okay. So she's so she's bought me out of that business. So it's not it wasn't that it floundered. In fact, it was a really positive. Everything about it has been very positive. And I made a tiny small profit um, out of the sale. So you know, if you are looking to expanding your business as a means of, of making a profit, you can do it. And the reason that it worked so well was because I had systems and protocols that I could plug and play. So yeah. literally we took all of our systems and all of our protocols and we plugged it into an already, you know, an already existing business, which had none of that. Yes. And even with really, really severe circumstances, that business grew. Yeah. But only because it had that backup in my opinion, well, not, not only, it had good people. Yes. You know, it had reliable um, a physio, veterinary physio, and a reliable vet that also put in the hours. But without that underlying support system, I don't believe it would have done as well as what it did. 
So that was really unlucky <laughs> to buy a new practice one month before lockdown. I exactly. mean, exactly. Yeah, and also obviously the distance is a major yeah. problem um, because you know here in South Africa we were like locked down for like six weeks or so, weren't we? Um, so we, I mean, we couldn't. And I think that some, I think as a vet, you are probably still maybe able to work, but some of the vet we have therapists weren't able to because we weren't mm. considered essential services. Um, so yeah, that must have been a little bit stressful <laughs> trying to start and also to put all those systems and, and staff and, you know, trying to get everything together um, when you're not really able to be there all the time. And yeah, so um, well done for getting through yeah, that. Thanks. And what? So, yeah. So Kara? that's, I mean, the other thing about the reason that it was able to to be so successful aside from those factors that I've also mentioned is that when you're running multiple practices your contact time with the people that are maybe managing the branches or actually working in the branches because from a distance perspective you might not be able to get there your contact time you have to allow for that so we have team meetings every week I have one-on-one -on -one meetings with every team member every week takes time, takes me away from uh, consulting, but it adds to, it enables them and empowers them actually to be able to, to do the treatments and run the business um, successfully. Yeah. So that was another so, factor. So let's, let's tap into like the pros and cons. Um, so like, like, you know, if you have one branch, the team meetings a whole lot easier, right? When you've got three branches, because obviously this year, although you weren't able to like completely run it, you were still involved mm. last year. Um, and that's so you had three branches at one stage. So what what were what were the struggles and the challenges of having the three branches? Not necessarily in COVID, just in general. Um, so having those team meetings, um, yeah, just from your side. I, I think the um the biggest challenge is who have you got on your team? So when you are choosing to expand, we've already, you know, it's a given. You're not going to be able to do everything. Okay, so you need to make sure that your team members are, um, they buy into your vision. They have similar value systems to what you do. And then they become an asset. So then they become a real positive factor. They become a pro. And then your, your management is easy. So the con is if you've hired the wrong person um, and it's not necessarily always skill set. In fact, skill set can be taught, but, but your, I don't even want to say your personality. It's the value system of the people yeah. that you bring into your company is vitally important. Um, yeah. And, and they've been, I mean, you learn that also as you go along, but if you understand what your values are, and what your vision is, then whatever you choose to do on from there should be relatively easy, if I can put it that way. So, yeah, I think the, the distance is a, so that your team members can be advantageous or disadvantageous. So choose them carefully. Um, and then time, time is always a factor. So you, you have to be able to adequately manage your time so we you know we always you've spoken lots about planning and you know daily planners and priority lists and what's urgent and what's not urgent and so you have to learn to move away from crisis management if you can so when you introduce a new branch there will be a measure of crisis because it's new and it's exciting so that's your that's your disadvantage your advantage is if you've got the systems and the other team members in place, you should be able to meld them um, together. Um, hmm. I think those are probably the biggest ones. There's probably a whole lot more, but it's it, it, they don't always come together in a you know in a sequence. Yeah. So I mean, the staff. Um, you know, we've all done that. We've all hired people from their CV, thinking, "Wow, this person's super qualified," and then you know. And I've made this mistake so many times. You just don't realize until you realize um, about your your core values that the, that you you you're not aligned. If you don't know about it, you just you just think like, why is this not working? Like, why? Where is the miscommunication here? Like, what what is going on? 
Um, but those core values, I mean, I've spoken so many times about this. It's so, so important. Like if mm. somebody is misaligned with you, that's where the disconnect happens. Um, mm. So they can be a brilliant therapist and they can be a great person. Um, so like, you know, often you'll, you'll actually hire people and they're, they're great people, they're nice people, they're great therapists, but then something just is not right. Um, and I think, you know, for me, I think a lot of the time it was usually around work ethic. Um, so I've got a very high work ethic and a very high standard. And um, so like, if you know that about yourself, when you interview somebody, then you really want to ask them, like you want to try and find out about that. So it's not just about, you know, how qualified they are or like what a therapist they are, because if you're expecting them to work like the same work ethic as you and the same standard as you, and that's not their standard, you're going to be continually banging heads. But yep. you don't realize it until you realize it, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, so being like, yeah, being attuned with like, what are your core values? And then asking those questions. And I think that this is something that in, like, we never got training on how to interview, mm -hmm. right? At veterinary school, we never knew. Like, um, and, and even, even now, like, I mean, I must say for me, I still, you know, when I interview someone, so I've just recently now hired an, a new person for online pet health. And um, I, I actually think I really wax my interview. Like I, I think I asked that person the exact right questions because of everything that's happened and every other person that I've hired before and afterwards thinking, no, that was not right. You know, there was just mm. that little bit of a disconnect. Um, and so like I've got, and I think if you get your questions right, you can actually find that person. But it's yeah. not all just about this is the time you work and this is what time, you know, this is the amount of leave and this is what you're going to get paid. And, you know, this is the machinery we've got. There's so many other things that you've got to be asking them to see whether they're aligned with you and with the rest of the team. Cause that's the other mm. thing. Once you get mm. all those people that are aligned in core values, then you get another one person who isn't. And then they just don't fit in with everyone, right? Not just with you. That often yeah. happens is misalignment within the team. Um, yeah. And I think some people can tolerate certain like core value misalignment more than others and other some other person that might be so important and it's just yeah not working yeah so yeah. when you chat about staff like one of the things that i think about having multiple practices you know one of the challenges in a normal practice is when you are busy like your practices and i remember mine being the same just fully booked waiting mm. lists somebody phones in sick now somebody phones in sick and you've got multiple branches so you're like in your practice you're dealing with that you're consulting how do you handle those kind of situations where you're like you you're consulting today and now somebody is sick at another practice and you've got to juggle all of that and um, did you have systems in place for that did you have a plan how did you handle it yeah it's a really good question because it's incidentally just happened <laughs> um after the easter weekend and um so what happens is that most of my uh, team members don't consult eight hours a day. So we work in five hour shifts or four hour shifts. And you might choose to do a double shift on a day, um, but there's always uh, some leeway. And so really what happens is if it's your time to be doing something else or it's your time to be off or it's your time to be doing admin because you know, or contacting clients, you then slot into the, the practical, you know, now we have to treat those patients. And the administrative side has to fall a little bit by the wayside. And um, I am working on, and this is something if you want to get into multiple practices, is you really need to look at, this is my experience now, because of these things that happen, is you need to try to have a reservoir of people that you can call on. Mm -hmm. So the profession is growing. Um, not everyone is going to be employed. Not everyone is going to be running their own business. There are going to be people that are between. And so can you build up a cache of people, if I can put it that way, that you could call upon in the event that something like this happens? Because it will happen. Yeah. Um, and again, we do have standard operating procedures. So the, the receptionist knows if this happens, She's got to go there and she's got to go there and she's got to go there and she's this, she's got to call this person, this person, this person. So those procedures are already in place. So the rest of the team 
also doesn't come to work and suddenly they find that now they have to work a double shift and they've also booked a doctor's appointment. Okay, so all of those, that planning in the event of this happening has to be there. But ideally, if you could have, because it places a lot of strain on everyone now to do extra shifts. Yeah. Um, so if you could ideally have a number of qualified practitioners that you, call, even if you call in, you know, once a week, they have a locum position, they, you know, they're coming in once a week to alleviate the times of the other practitioners. Hopefully they would then be able to fill that gap um, in the event that a crisis happens where somebody is ill and booked up for a long time. And it's really valid because, you know, we end up with some sort of a upper respiratory tract infection and now we've, we've been drummed in, oh, it's COVID. So now we we too darn scared to go to the office because now we know we're going to come into contact with 20 or 25 or 40 people in that day. But I don't know if I'm COVID positive or not. Um, we want to be responsible. So yeah, it's a it's a very real um, situation. Yeah. Yeah, like you say with the COVID thing, and because you also got to think about the clients and everyone. Mm. You have to, yeah, you know, and then it takes a while to obviously get that test back. Um, so I think we are really lucky here in South Africa. We've got quite a lot of vet rehab therapists and it's a really growing profession. Um, mm -hmm. But if I think about other places, so other countries, so especially Europe, um, they might be in an area, I mean, even some of them now are like wanting to expand their practices and they just don't have the benefit of having anyone to locum. Um, and if you think about when you and I first started, I mean, we were in that position, right? Um, yeah. There was no locum for us. There was very little holiday for us. Um, yeah, I mean, so there are a lot of people that are not in that position, um, but it's just one of the struggles. One of the things that we have to have a system in place. Um, but yeah, you when you're in that situation where you've got a three-week waiting list, that one day, you've got no way to reschedule those. Um, and yeah. I, I remember clearly that happening to me, you know, and I remember just being so sick and literally having to go into into work like you just have to work no matter how sick you were like you had to be ready i remember once i had german measles um that time i had to take off and that was like a two week but luckily i did find um a, a german um, vet actually who was able to do a locum for me so she was a german vet who could do acupuncture um so she took on my acupuncture clients but not necessarily my rehab clients um but yeah it is it's definitely a struggle um managing multiple branches let alone just yeah. the one branch when you've got um, sick people let's chat about the admin side of things so I, I mean when you've got multiple branches can you group all of that or does the admin need to happen at each and individual practice separately so i think um i think you need to separate you need to look at what you're trying to achieve so you know if, as we've been talking i've also been thinking if you want to expand you need to understand why you want to expand um, because you have to do a fair amount of self, in, a fair amount of introspection to, to make that choice, because you, it's not something that should be taken lightly. So when you come to the admin, I think what we have, our admin is, a lot of it is, like I said, you can plug and play. Those are our, our um, patient systems, our data collection systems, um, our, we even use the same invoicing system, but we separate that into separate branches because it's easier from a, um, from a bookkeeping perspective to say, well, this belongs in Pretoria, this belongs in Benoni, this belongs to the other branch. So they, they, they were initially together and it took a lot of work for the bookkeeper to actually separate them. So now we run them on the invoicing system as separate companies, but the rest of the admin is actually all together online on a system that we can access from wherever we are. So that makes it um, very easy. I can see everybody's booking schedule right now on my computer. Um, and so the forms and the all of that, patient notes, all of that is accessible by everyone throughout the system. And yes, we do have to worry about Poppy, you know, that whole... Um, protection of people's information act that's coming out so yes you do have to make sure that you are um, you are compliant with whatever the laws are that are applicable for your country if that's the system that you're going to choose to use yeah so, yeah um, no, and, really and then beneficial because if you like sometimes especially like you've got two branches that are quite close 
let's say somebody's sick at the one branch and you don't get a replacement. So you, mm. then there's a patient that has to be seen. You might say, come to our Benoni branch yep. and then you don't have access to their, their medical records or anything. At least then you can see, like, you know what the therapist there has been doing if it's not your patient. So not, not a patient that you've seen before. Um, so it really helps with those kind of things. Yeah, so I think, I mean, that's a really important um, point that you've made. So I've created my businesses so that um, we don't have, we try not to have patients that belong to a specific therapist. Okay, there are preferences and we do accommodate those as far as possible. But we, we do, I believe for two reasons, this is good. Number one, I don't think that the pressure that's created on a, an individual, you know, I only want to see you. I mean, we've been there. I'm only going to see you. I'm only going to see Tanya. I'm only going to see Megs. The pressure that that puts on you is tremendous. And it's not because, you know, you, you, you're not the only person with those skills. You're the only person with your personality. You are unique, but you're not the only person with those skills. So we try not to have our therapists stick always with the same patient. The second reason I, I do that, so the first is for, is for our own pressures and sense of well-being. But the second is because every single therapist has a different viewing point and a different perspective. And we um, prefer one skill over another, or one modality over another. And so I believe that if we have another therapist that is looking at that same patient, we are able to pick up things that the other person may become complacent about because, oh, we just see this dog all the time. Um, so I think it's one of our strengths. And as a result of that, I've had to create systems where everything is interchangeable. So we can tag people on a patient notes and say, look, I'm concerned. I know you're seeing this patient in two days time. Um, please look out for this. Um, which I think is a, is a really, it's an important thing because you're not left in the dark. There's nothing worse than coming into, especially when you're newly qualified or you're new in a job. And you come in and you know nothing about that patient and the notes are incomplete. I mean, I am pedantic about notes, not just because they're legal documents, but because I want to be able to walk in. I want somebody to be able to walk into that consulting room and be able to say, all right, I know this is the problem. I know this is where we are with the therapy. Here's what I propose we do. However, I don't know your dog. Can I just get my hands on your dog for a few minutes so that I can cement everything as a therapist in myself, and then I'll be able to treat your dog in, to the best of my ability. We don't want people to be compromised. We don't want the patient, the client, or the therapist to be compromised. So, so I mean, I love that, that everyone gets to see the patients, because then also, like, I think that you can also learn so well from one another, because you can chat about cases. But how do you manage that when you've got multiple branches. So then you expect your therapist that maybe lives really close to Pannoni, for example, your one branch, do they then have to rotate to the other practices? Um, so like that other branch was, a, you, mm. you said there was one therapist there. So does everyone rotate to all the practices or there's some that just stay in the main branch and then there are a few that rotate? How do you manage all of that? Yeah, it's a good question. I, we, we basically have therapists that stay in each of the branches. And then in the event of illness or leave, we'll rotate therapists. So they don't, they're not always rotating. But I mean, in Benoni, at one point, I had three therapists. Or I do still have three therapists. So, you know, that's, and then they work in different places. So the, the therapist in Pretoria also works in Benoni but there's not another therapist currently that works in Pretoria. So yeah, it is a, it, it's just a system that developed. I think the big, the, the other issue is the, the veterinary aspect of it. So as a vet, I'm going from practice to practice to practice, mm -hmm. but my therapists tend to be um, mostly stationed in one place. And if we have a, um, an upset, it puts them in a position to actually travel to, one of those other branches if the need arises. And then all the information is there and able to be read. And, you know, we, we and then they, you can pick up the phone. Now we, you know, like it's really easy these days. So, so are you the only vet? I am currently. 
Um, I'm on the hunt for another one. Uh, yeah. I have advertised. I'm also on the hunt for a physio. Let me just get that in there. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, vets, vets with acupuncture skills in South Africa are becoming more and more available. Vets with physical rehab skills um, are still not readily available in South Africa. Um, and I think mean, you need both. Um, so you yes. need somebody to replace you, you know, if need be. You need yeah. that other person. So they you need to, yeah. That's what happens when you, you study too much, Tanya. Then you're hard to <laughs> you, you just done too much learning. <laughs> but you do, you know, you have to have a long-term idea too, you know. So yeah. it's not that I haven't had vets that have worked with me and partnered with me. And, you know, our lives are journeys. So people come and people go and, yeah. and, you know, you spend some time together and then it's, you know, it's time to move apart and they spread their wings or they don't, or they have a family or whatever. So I'm constantly looking actually for those people to move in and hopefully some will stay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I definitely could do with one now, more than one. I think when you have your own practice, you have to get to that level of acceptance that people will come and go. Um, mm. And when people go, don't take it personally. Like mm. you said, they're just on their journey and it's different to yours. Um, so just, yeah, you treasure the time that you have with them. And sometimes, you know, I think, especially when you, you train somebody for a long time, you know, and you get them to the point and then they go and spread their wings. Maybe they want to open up their own practice. Then you're like, oh no, but I've just got them to the point. But that's the journey, right? That's what, that's what we're here for. Um, so it's not only treating the patients, you also people, they're people and people that work with us that are growing in their own way. Yeah. And then they, they go and expand and do whatever they do and they help more pets somewhere else. And that's okay. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so the practice that, you know, we bought just before lockdown, it's, it has been amazing because she is one of the vets that did work for me. And then we partnered and now she's like, no, I'm okay. I'm, I'd like to make you an offer and do this on my own. I mean, it's fabulous. It's, in what, it's kind of bittersweet because like you say, in one way, you've invested a number of years in this person and you kind of like hope if you gel, oh, can we please stay together? But in yeah. another way, it's amazing because of what you've contributed to that growth yeah. and to that. And as you say, they go on to treat more animals and, and your legacy lives on. Yeah, exactly. And they create their own legacy and their legacy lives on. So it doesn't stop. Yeah. Yeah. And you're just part of the, the puzzle of the bigger picture of what they meant to do, yeah. Yep. Um, so we chatted about the admin. What about the marketing side of things? Um, so do you like market all together or does each individual practice do their own marketing? How do you work that? No, so I market together um, basically because I have um, a very specific um, set of values and ways in which I want the company to be represented or the business to be represented. And um, so all the marketing comes from one source. No, it doesn't come from one source. It is accessed from one place. So there's only one Facebook page and um, there's only one website. There's only one Instagram um, post. There's a LinkedIn post. So those things all have one um, area that from which the, the marketing is disseminated, but the information and the stories come from everywhere. So I encourage everyone to, to give their, you know, their success stories and to put it in some sort of video format, some sort of a blog, some sort of a, I mean, anything, anything. I really want them to be creative and then we'll use that. So it's part of the job description. If you want to come and work at Animal Health and Hydro, that you have to contribute on that level. So we've, we're at the moment, we've got a therapist that's really, really good at writing and another one that's fantastic at creating videos. And the two of them have now said, okay, well, you do the text, I'll do the videos and then we'll create something spectacular. And then that goes onto, um, onto the, the social media and so on. So, and so it's nice to be able to allow everyone to find their own little space, but at the same time to be encouraged, you do need to find that space. So he has a platform, but it's all from one, it's all from one central source, from one central area that we send out that info. Yeah. So if you look back now 
at all the branches and like what you've done. Is there anything like what's the biggest thing you've learned in having multiple branches? The biggest thing I've learned, oh, I, there's a lot of things I've learned. I think the biggest thing I've learned is if you, if you want it, if you want it and you understand your motivation, don't stop. Just go for it. Just go for it. Because there, there actually is not a mistake. There is only ways in which we learn. So I, I, one of my big driving forces in life is, you know, if I'm, if I'm excited and I'm scared out of my wits, I've got to move forward. I'm in that, in that moment where I know this is where it's going to be and I've got to go for it. So if, you, if you're in a position where you feel that way and you're thinking about expanding or you're thinking about changing something in your business, that's my driving force. So don't, yes, you're going to be scared, but take that step anyway, because whatever happens, you're going to learn something. And maybe that's my biggest learning factor is that it doesn't matter. You're going to be okay in the end. So just do it. It doesn't have to be a big leap. It can be a small step, but do it. And if it doesn't work out like you think it should have, it's okay. What did you learn? Yeah, well, I think that's in business. That's what we always yeah. do. We're making yeah. decisions, um, sometimes they're wrong, but then it's, the important thing is to learn from it. So to yeah. actually say, well, okay, that didn't work. Um, when, yeah, when we expand, I think that we also need to look at what is our motivation to expand. Mm. Um, and I think for most of us, it, most of us, it's to help more animals, but there's obviously also the financial side of it. Um, so for you, has there been a financial, um, positive financial um, reward for creating multiple branches? Um, because, you know, obviously sometimes the time we put into these things and if we've got more branches, it's more work for us. Um, we do want to be rewarded in some way. So sometimes it might just be that we treat more patients and that's enough for us. But for other people, they might their motivation might be, you know, financial gain. How's it been for you? Yeah, I, I think we run a business. So if you look at the definition of a business, it's a profitable commercial enterprise. Ideally, that should work without you. So in the end, yes, we are mostly motivated by our desire to help more patients, but we also want a financial gain from it. And the best way I've seen to do that is to understand your business. So you have to spend time on understanding, you know, how many people are you seeing? What is your cost, you know, what is your, um, trans, your, your um, average cost of transaction? What's your cost of marketing? What's the investment you're making? Um, what's your return on investment? So as much as we don't necessarily want to do those figures, we need to do them. So the returns are there, but you must also understand that in order to get those returns, there is a risk. So you have to weigh up how much can you or are you prepared to risk for that return? Yeah. But there should always be um, some sort of financial gain um, in terms of doing of, of creating your business. There should also be there should also be personal reward. There should also be satisfaction. So I'm not in any way, in fact, that's my probably even a bigger driving factor for me than money or than financial gain. But um, you must start seeing your position as one where you need to be not just surviving. You need to thrive. Yeah. And before well, you, you might as well work for someone else, right? <laughs> exactly. So before you expand, are you surviving or thriving? Mm -hmm. Because actually, if you're only surviving, you're going to carry that into your expansion. Yeah. It's good advice. So like, look at your primary practice and make sure that you've got that right. So are your systems mm. all correct? Um, do you, is everything there working smoothly? Because you can't have a practice that's not running smoothly. You're not making profit in, and think that another branch is the answer. Um, because most of the time it isn't. But, correct. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think you're right, you know, I think that a lot of us go into this field because we love what we do 
Um, but we do need we do need to make money out of it because as the owner of a practice, we invest so much more time and energy into the practice. And that in the end needs to be rewarded. Um, mm. So you, you need to look in, in your long-term picture. Um, and I love that, um, you know, that um, saying that you said that it needs to run without you. So eventually you, you need to actually plan, even though you might never do that. It mm. might, you might work in it for the rest of your life because that's what you want to do. But you need to be in a position where it's able to should the, the circumstances arise. So let's say you're sick or a family member sick and you want to take three months off. You ideally want your business to be in that situation where it would just keep going without. Then it yeah. is a source of income for you. It's there when you're ready to come back to it. But um, yeah, I think a lot of our practices and if I think back to my practice, you know, when I went on maternity leave, um, you know, the wheels fell off because the systems weren't in place mm. to handle me not being there. Um, so we we got to we got to look at all those things and make sure that our practices can actually run without us. Yeah, I, I mean, on that note, I think what's really important is, as a rehab practitioner, we sell time for money. We're never going to get ahead if we sell time for money. So what we have to do is we have to learn to leverage what else or, div or diversify or both. So one of the ways of leveraging is multiple branches yeah. because now it's not just me. Now I have many yeah. um, and many that hopefully are profitable. And therefore I am able to create more wealth for myself as the business owner. Um, so that it, it is important if you expand that that is one of your motivators. Um, but the other thing is diversification, because as long as we're in a service industry, which we all are, if we don't diversify or find ways of adding value to our services, we're forever going to be in a struggle. Sure. I actually did a webinar. So for, for the listeners that are interested, um, it is in the online pet health platform under the business section. And it's also in the free area. So if you're an online pet health free member, if you go into the business area, it's called diversifying your income. Um, and for a lot of us, you know, that had practices when COVID hit, this was something that we suddenly realized, oh my gosh, I have just my practice. That's my only source of income. And, and yeah, that was actually when I did the webinar, I thought, okay, let me, you know, talk about all the ways in which I looked at it, which I had um, diversified my income as well as other ways other people have. Um, Tanya, this is something that, that you've been doing for a while. Won't you share with the listeners the ways in which you diversify your income? So not just the branches, there are other things like online um, teaching um, courses, all that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, I do enjoy teaching. I like to share my knowledge. So it was natural for me to branch in, into that um, arena. And it started actually with workshops. So, you know, if I, can, if I can teach something to 10 people as opposed to treating one animal and one person, then I've already leveraged my time. So it started there. And we are still, although that, um, that demand has dropped because of the, you know, world situation we find ourselves in, they are, I'm now only doing on request. So I'm not creating, I'm not saying I have a workshop, how many people it's basically now, these are the workshops that I can offer, but I will tailor make one for you if that's what you require. So one of the detection companies um, or one of the companies that trains detection dog, dogs recently asked us to create something for their trainers that are in out places out of the way with little equipment, little space, and just to, for the dog's resilience um, and stress relief. So that's one way. The other way is, um, is with online courses and webinars and sharing information. I mean, you could write eBooks. I mean, that's, that's also on the cards, but if you want to sell an eBook um, or you want to sell something, then you need to also make sure that your information is correct. Um, there's a lot of free downloadable information and that's great. Um, for starting to build um, um, a sort of an audience. So yeah, I think the, the, the workshops in person and the online workshops or the online courses have been 
um, my biggest diversification. And I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of people also interested in um, helping out with that as well. So that enables them to, yeah. Yeah, I think online, I mean, I think everyone has gone online, right, with COVID, mm. which is like the move. Um, and I've seen a lot of vet rehabbers starting online courses, and I'm really doing so well, so successful with it. Um, it is a big commitment. Um, mm. It is something that you need time to do. So it's not a quick thing. Um, so we, we have some training in the Business Vet Rehabbers Facebook group. That's a free group, so you guys can hop on over there. And um, we actually did a, a training there a few months ago. So go and have a search for that. Um, all about creating an online course. Um, but it is something, like Tanya says, you can even just start off with an ebook. So just create an ebook, get someone to put it together and sell that, see if that how that goes. And if there's interest, then you can look at creating something a little bit more, more in depth. Yeah. So Tanya, um, have you ever thought, I mean, obviously, like when I think about these multiple practices, like my next thought is like the next move would be to franchise right um so i know that deborah and sherman knapp have got um bosm and they have franchises um which is really unusual is that theirs are all over the world right um so they that's the only other um vet rehab practice that i can think has actually got a franchise is this a move that you thought about um or you're not there yet <laughs> it's um it's definitely a move I've thought about. Um it's uh it's not for the faint-hearted. So my um my move is there, um, but it takes a lot of there's a lot of legalities, there's a lot of um background work that needs to be done in order to set up a franchise. But the short uh, the short answer is yes. I, I am moving into franchising and I'm quite excited. I think it's going to be, it's, you know, franchising in the veterinary world in South Africa is rare. And we do see it uh, elsewhere. And part of the reason is our veterinary act. So a, veten a, a business that offers any veterinary or animal related services, uh, veterinary services needs to be um, registered with the veterinary council and the owner needs to be registered with veterinary council so we are in the position now where with the whole promulgation of the veterinary um, uh, physiotherapy as a profession in south africa they there's still a few things that we also hurdles that we have to overcome and a few more hoops to jump through but they should be in a position once that is done to own their own practice which means that they would be able to own a franchise if that's what they chose so yeah yeah it is there are lots it is. of benefits as a vet rehabber like especially if you've just qualified for the assistance i mean really that's what you're buying you're buying the yep. model that you know that works right um yes. so instead of spending the five or six years to try and work it all out yourself you buy the model and you just plug and play it you know you and and then you really get to do what you want to do is be the vet rehab therapist um yeah so yeah that's really exciting so good luck with that yeah. <laughs> um, thank you um yeah i'm sure there are loads of loads of challenges but you've you know i think having the multiple branches you know and and if you think about it that one practice that you bought before covid that was sort of a good tester right because you Absolutely. sort of yep. um, you, you you did put all your systems in place and they're the person you know it the the practice was working so well that they made you an offer so I think that that was probably one of the things that probably lit the fire under that idea and said, okay, well, this might actually work. Um, so yeah, looking forward to, to following that. Um, and if anyone in South Africa is interested, um, I'm not sure when Tanya's going to be getting those franchises out, but you can always just give her a call, I'm sure, and have a chat yeah, about it. It's imminent. So if you're interested, you're very welcome to contact me and um, we can have a talk. And who knows, maybe it'll be international. <laughs> eventually so maybe just starting in South Africa and then you could go international with it uh, you know I believe that there are no limits yeah except exactly the limits that we set ourselves so yep who Love knows it. where it will go <laughs> Love it. awesome Tanya it's been great chatting to you thank you for sharing um all your um ups and downs and all your challenges and um yeah looking forward um and watching the space to see what happens in um, animal health and hydro's franchising Perfect. Thanks, Meg. Thanks for your time. It's always great to be with you and 
yeah, and to hear about your experiences. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Cheerio. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. And please, if you get a moment, head over to Stitcher or iTunes and leave me a review. It's a really lonely job being a podcaster. And so the only time I get to hear from you or know that you're out there is when I get a review. And know that I read every single one of your reviews. So to those of you that have left reviews, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Every time we get a review, it really helps to get the Vet Knee Rehabilitation Podcast out there to all the vet rehabbers all over the world. All right, vet rehabbers, so if you are looking for more continuing education in the field of veterinary rehabilitation, head over to onlinepetout.com. Go be awesome, guys.